here is where we are, where the last we looked, uh, we uh, looked at stochastic gradient descent as uh, a mechanism for optimizing the uh, loss function for backpropagation. So, uh, using back, uh, during backpropagation. So, uh, SGD, in SGD, we presented training instances one at a time and showed that under some conditions, they can actually, this can actually be more effective than simply uh, training on the entire data all at once. For SGD, SGD, SGD to converge, the learning rate must shrink sufficiently rapidly with iterations. Uh, estimates can have higher variance than batch estimates. We saw this. And uh, we saw an extension to SGD, which was mini batch training, where you worked on batches of instances at a time. And uh, this uh, results in a reduction of the variance and the loss function that you're trying, the variance of the estimates, because the loss function is computed over batches. But then uh, uh, this comes with a trade off. Convergence rate is, is, uh, is theoretically worse than SGD. But because you can patch perform batch processing, you actually end up with uh, uh, net gains. And in practice, we found that uh, mini batches actually give you better results, at least on the one example that we did see, than simply using uh, stochastic gradient descent. So uh, uh, in all of these, again, convergence depends on learning rate. And we saw that uh, we had some requirements for the learning rate, that it must be square integrable but the learning rates must sum to infinity so that you can search the entire space. And uh, we looked at a couple of different schedules for learning rates, just falling off as one over K. There were others mentioned, uh, I think, in the uh, slides. And then we saw one instance where you could use the same learning rate and then every time, every time something converged, you could step down and keep repeating that process. And that learning rate too satisfies the criteria that we set forth. Now, uh, Again, in all of these, you have to decide the learning rate schedule. And uh, if things don't work just right, then uh, you might not actually achieve the optimum that you would like to. So it's better to have adaptive updates where the learning rate itself is determined as part of the estimation. And for that, we're going to revisit trend algorithms, which are momentum-based methods. Now, you'll remember momentum. Here's what we did. gradient, but then you took a running average of the current gradient with the past step to give you the current step. So you were maintaining a running average of the steps. And in, some, in this manner, you were sort of smoothing out the variations that you saw in the gradient. Guess what? Incremental SGD and mini batch gradients tend to have high variance. And uh, momentum smooths out these variations. So moment, these trend methods actually help you when you're trying to perform incremental updates. Uh, so uh, here is uh, how the uh, pseudocode for uh, batch processing with momentum would change. This is just like the usual uh, pseudocode for batch processing, except that now you'd be computing the derivatives. And the step size is not just the directly the derivative, but a running average of the previous step size and the current derivative. And uh, that's what you're going to uh, increment your parameters by. Again, the point being that uh, the momentum, there's nothing really magical happening over here. This is the same momentum rule that we saw earlier, except now you're applying it to every batch. And uh, in this particular instance, we find that uh, having the kind of smoothing that momentum gives you can help you smooth out the variances, the variations that uh, you would encounter under conventional uh, SGD or mini batch. Same thing with Nesterov's acceler accelerated gradient. This was exact. This was the. Uh, uh, this was we saw this in the last class. When you use Nesterov's method, you first take a step and then compute the gradient. So you take a step in the current direction and then compute the gradient. That gives you the net uh, the final uh, uh, step. Now this also applies directly to incremental updates, and this too has the same property that it's going to smooth out the variations the, that you get in your basic uh, SGD. So here was Nesterov's method again. You compute the gradient, but not at the current location, but after extending the current location by, uh, by adding 
a scaled version of the current step. So instead of computing the gradient here, first you go to this point, then you compute the gradient there, and then you add that gradient to the extended uh, uh, current step, and that gives you the final uh, update. And that's what you're going to add to your parameters. This was Nestor's method, right? So this we can again use this for momentum methods, for uh, uh, incremental methods. It's exactly the same thing, except now you're going to be doing the same thing over batches. You take the initial step, you compute the gradient, then you update the uh, parameters with the gradient from the location that you arrived at and also track the current step. So uh, the same, this is exactly the same code that we had for Nestor's method earlier, except that now we're applying it over many batches. And this is expected to help uh, smooth out some of the variations that you get when, you're, when you have incremental updates. But then there are other methods. And if you've been doing your homeworks, most of you have been using Adam. So where exactly do these methods come in? Now, all of these, the one Adam is one instance of the various other algorithms that have been proposed uh, to, uh, to improve the convergence of uh, stochastic gradient descent and mini batch descent. And the various techniques are Adagrad, Ada Delta, RMS Prop, Adam, several others. So what are all of these other techniques doing? To understand, let's go back and look at what happens when we actually perform uh, these gradient updates. When we perform gradient updates, we saw that if I had the, uh, if I plotted, this is iteration, this is the gradient, right? Delta D error over the parameter. So in some directions, we saw that the, the derivative would keep flipping sign. In other directions, if you computed the derivative, you get something more consistent. And the, and the entire logic, the rationale behind the momentum methods was that in these methods, in, the, in these directions, the steps are not really achieving anything. They're swinging back and forth, but you can sort of account for this by averaging. And when you average, the back slip flips back and forth will sort of cancel out. And whereas over here, when you average, the there are no flips, so the whole thing is going to extend. But then what, what happens over here? You're only looking at the average. The average is the first moment of these terms. Now, but you can also help this further by looking at the second moment. If you look at the, uh, look at what happens in these directions, if you sum up the lengths of all of these steps, those lengths, that sum is greater than the sum of the lengths in, these, in this direction. So in directions where there's a lot of wild swinging, you're going to have a lot of movement without really getting anywhere. In directions where you're moving prog prog progressively towards the optimum, you're, it's going to be much more conservative and you're, going to, and you're going to sort of proceed towards the optimum in a much more smooth manner. So here, for example, here's an example, where you have this oscillation as the, uh, as the uh, iterations proceed towards the optimum. And if you look at the step sizes in the x and y components, which I measured off this little figure, you can see that along the x components, they're like one, one, three, one, two, they're always proceeding forwards. In the y component, they're swinging back and forth. And so uh, the, uh, the y component, you really don't have a net progress because you're sort of canceling each other out, although you're moving a lot. So uh, one thing to look at is, if I look at the total magnitude of the variation over here along the y, that total magnitude is, is greater than the variation for x. So instead of simply looking at the average, can we also look at the total motion? How do you compute the total motion? The total motion is really the, the variance of the steps. If you look at the variance of the steps in this direction, or rather the second moment, that's going to be quite small. Over here, you're swinging between positive and negative terms, so that's going to be quite large. So the idea behind these other methods is that instead of simply considering only the average, which only looks at the first moment of these steps, can you also sort of scale the steps by the second moment? And so 
uh, the uh, algorithm which sort of captures the the uh, the uh, the concept behind this idea best is probably RMS prop. But here is the whole thing: if you have something of this kind, uh, in the, in the recent past you'll find that the total movement in the y component of updates is high, the movement in the x components is lower. So the idea is to modify the usual gradient-based update, except you want to scale down the y component, not just average it, but also scale it down, because you realize that in this y component, I'm swinging around a whole lot, I'm moving a lot. I shouldn't really be moving that much. Whereas you want to scale up, or maybe you want to scale uh, x by a smaller value. Scale down x by a smaller value, or maybe even scale up x. So you want to scale these components according to their variation, not just the average. And what is a good, uh, good uh, quantification of the variation? The variation is the average magnitude, but the magnitude is better than the average magnitude. The root mean squared value is a pretty good estimate for how much you're actually swinging around in any particular direction. So here's what, this is, this is the idea behind RMS prop. In RMS prop, you'd compute the derivative in each direction. And then within each direction, you're going to maintain an estimate of the running estimate of how much the total squared value movement was in, in that direction. And then subsequently, you're going to scale down the steps in each direction by the square root of this total variation, which is basically the RMS value, the root mean squared value. So here's what the uh, uh, algorithm looks like. At each step, you'd compute the, deri the, the, the derivative, and then you'd compute the second, the squared derivative. This is not the second derivative. I'm using poor notation. This should have been derivative squared. The square must have been outside, but uh, this is the squared derivative. So basically, in each direction, you're computing this length, but then you are maintaining a running average of the squares of these lengths. So here is the current estimate. And you're taking gamma times the current estimate plus one minus gamma times the current, the square of the current derivative, right? So that's going to give you the current, the, uh, the uh, current estimate of the sum squared value of the steps in that direction. And then you divide the step size by the square root of this. So this term over here is the root mean squared value. And so what is happening over here is that directions where you have a lot of swinging, you're going to have a high RMS value. So the step size is going to get shrunk down. Directions where you don't have a lot of swinging, the RMS value is going to be sort of more consistent, smaller, and that step size is going to either shrink less or maybe even be magnified. So the difference between this and simple momentum is that in the momentum methods, you're only looking at the average, the first moment of the derivatives. Here you're also looking at the second moment of the derivatives. But observe something interesting over here. In the process of doing this, you actually end up with something very similar to R prop. So in fact, when RMS prop was originally proposed, it was really proposed as some as maybe an extension of R prop, so you can uh, see the similarity of names, R prop versus RMS prop. And, the, and why is it like R prop? Take a look over here. So this is the root mean squared value of the derivative. This is the derivative itself. In the ideal case, the root mean squared value and the derivative are going to be the same value, right? So these two terms would be canceling out. The only thing that remains is the sign of the derivative. And so you're going to be only following the sign of the derivative in, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, limiting case over here. Uh, in each direction. So that's a, lot, that's a lot like what we actually do in R prop, if you'll remember, right? But the basic concept here, of course, is that you're using the second moment to normalize out the step size, to account for, why, uh, account for the swinging in the, uh, in the iterations, in, in the estimates during the iterations. So this is just the, uh, the uh, uh, pseudocode. Again, observe that I've just, in this code, now we are keeping track of the, uh, the sums of the, the, you're maintaining a running average of the squared moment, and then you're dividing by the square root of this running average, right? Now, so 
the thing is, when you're doing R prop, RMS prop, you are only taking, a, taking into account the second moment, but now you're no longer taking into account the first moment. So you went from not canceling out the first moment during when you, were, when you were using momentum to sort of normalizing out the second moment when you did RMS prop, why not combine the two? And so when you combine the two, you end up with the algorithm that you've all probably been using, which is Adam. So in Adam, you do two things. First, you actually maintain a running average of the derivative, so you're computing. So basically, you're averaging the derivative in each direction, but you're also normalizing this average by the RMS value of the derivative, which is, so you're maintaining two terms. One is the running average of the derivative itself. The other is the running average of the squared derivative. And then the final update that you actually perform is going to be step size, you normalize by the squared derivative, and uh, the actual derivative you use is the running average of the derivative. So you see the direct, uh, the extension of RMS prop into this algorithm, right? Instead of just using the current derivative, you're maintaining an average, but you're also normalizing by the, uh, by the RMS value. Now there's an extra little tweak over here, which you will, you will see in this step. And this has to account for the fact that if you're just simply using these, the, these, uh, these rules, then in the initial steps, if your delta is large, say if your delta is one, close to one, then in the very first step, the initial estimate of this, these running averages is going to be zero. As a result, in the beginning of the algorithm, the algorithm is going to, the updates are going to move very, very slowly. So to account for it, they, are, they sort of normalize these guys by one minus delta raised to k. So in the early steps, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these terms will cancel out if you set them properly, and you actually get proper updates. But then as the steps sort of proceed, then they begin to dominate, and, uh, and uh, you'll actually get the smooth variance of the updates. So, uh, and there are other algorithms of the same kind. You have add a max, you have uh, add a grad, add a delta. Again, these are not completely independent of hyperparameters. So you still have to decide on some hyperparameters. We've seen these gammas and etas and such like, and people have gone through the effort of actually trying to find out what are good values for these parameters. And for RMS prop, for example, eta 0.001 and a gamma of 0.9 seems to work. For Adam, you have eta is 0.001, delta is 0.9, gamma is 0.999. So why is that? Because you want one minus gamma square root to be approximately the same as one minus delta. So uh, that's when in the early steps you're actually gonna get decent updates, right? So how well do all of these algorithms actually work? There's so many of them proposed. Is there any difference to how they perform? So uh, there's a very nice uh, web page over here where uh, uh, Alec Radford actually has run some simulations on a bunch of different objective functions. So this is the so-called Beals function, which has this shape. The initial estimate begins over here. This is the optimum that the various algorithms must arrive at. And you can send, he's listed a bunch of different algorithms that he's tested. Uh, there's momentum, there's Nestroff's method, SGD, Adagrad, Adagrad, Delta, RMS prop. You'll notice that this simulation doesn't actually include Adam. I assume that Adam's gonna be at least as fast as RMS prop. But the cool thing you will notice is that uh, they all have different ways of arriving to the solution. And typically Nestroff's is there as fast as anybody else. But look at where SGD is. SGD is still sort of wandering around somewhere close to home when the rest of the algorithms have sort of gone to sleep, done their job and gone to sleep. Uh, here is another uh, example again. And you'll notice that NAG actually sort of starts off slow but then accelerates really fastly. Uh, and he, in this case, Ada Delta is the fastest algorithm, but SGD is kind of still sitting up here. It's not really moving very much, right? Uh, and uh, here's another simulation. In this case, added delta is not the fastest one, but pretty much all of the methods get to the optimum way faster than SGD, which is kind of sleeping. So it gives you an idea of how, how these different algorithms compare when it comes to actually optimizing objective functions. Again, these are to be taken with a pinch of salt in that 
uh, if the objective function is more complicated, then the behavior that SGD has might be the one that you're really looking for. But the point being that the different momentum methods actually uh, have different properties, and specifically, the algorithms which also normalize out the variation, the, 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 uh, the second, which also account for the second order variation, they tend, they tend to be fast and yet smooth in getting to the optimum. So if you look over here, energy and momentum don't really consider the second moment. So uh, they sort of stick around over here and then suddenly fall down really fast. Whereas these are the methods which actually look at the second moment. And the methods which look at the second moment seem to have, uh, have some sort of a compromise where they are fast enough and yet they are not swinging a whole lot, right? Questions? No, okay. So anyway, moving on. Uh, gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates, and convergence can be improved using smooth updates. This is what we've seen so far, right? Now, uh, let's look at other kinds of tricks, generalizations, tricks of the trade, various other optimizations. And specifically, we'll look at uh, a couple of different uh, techniques that, are, that you might have encountered already, and also uh, what exactly do, do we expect in terms of uh, how these solutions look like, and you know, what is the point of regularization, for instance, and what kind of, uh, well, and a couple of different ways of regularizing things. So first, let's consider the issue of divergence, the divergence function itself. In all of the analyses, we've said convex, kind of convex, strongly convex, not convex. But all of these really depend, in, depend on the convexity or the curvature of your loss function depends on a bunch of different factors. It depends on your network, and it depends on the divergence function that you actually use. So uh, here's how we define our loss, right? We compute the divergences for the individual training instances. These divergences are a function of all of our network parameters, and then you take an average. So this means that the uh, curvature of this function is going to depend on the cur curvature of the divergence function itself, right? How does it depend? It? depend on it. Now, ideally, you want this guy to have a shape that results in a gradient that points your algorithm towards the optimum. So ideally, if I think of this error as a function of the parameters, if the loss function looks something like this, this is not really a very happy loss function. You're not going to find any kind of an optimum. Gradient descent is not going to go anywhere. If your loss function looks like this, clearly it has a global minimum, right? So you would expect your gradient descent to actually get to here. This too has a global minimum. You'd expect the gradient descent to actually get to here. But then this one is not a really good objective. This is a much better objective. Why? If you have low sl slopes, so if you go far away from the optimum, the slopes are very low. At the optimum, the slope is very steep. This is the exact opposite. Now in the first case, what you will see is if you have an objective like this one, when you're far away, because the steps that you take depend on the slope, you're going to take a lot of very small steps. And then when you get to the optimum that's really steep, you're going to take large steps, you're going to overshoot, and you're going to begin oscillating. So this guy is, again, not a very good loss function. The ideal kind of loss function is going to look something like this, where far away from the optimum, it's steep, so you're speeding towards the optimum. But then when you get close to the optimum, it sort of flattens out so that you don't begin swinging around the optimum. right? So this is the kind of solution that you would, this is the kind of loss uh, objective function that we really want. What do our objective functions actually look like? First, it depends on the divergence function itself. We've seen a couple of different divergences. So let's say I have only a scalar output. Then if I have a scalar output, you can either define a quadratic divergence, which is the L2 loss, or you can define the the cross entropy, which is uh, uh, one, one part of the kullback leibler divergence, which we saw looks like this, right? When you have a multivariate output, like if, like if you're performing a multi-class classification, or if you're predicting entire vectors, then once again, you're going to, you can have losses which are simply vector versions of these guys. So the L2 loss is going to be the Euclidean distance between the target output and the output of the network. And the cross-entropy loss, again, there should have been a, oh, this is scale, right? Uh, 
the cross entropy loss again is going to look uh, like the second term over here, which again is, uh, depends on both the target output and the actual uh, output. Now, both of these functions, both the L2 and the KL are convex functions of y. So for example, if I had a desired d, and if this were y, and if I were to plot the L2 divergence, that's going to be a quadratic, right? If I were to plot the kullback leibler divergence or the cross entropy, in the case of the cross entropy, you're only allowed to go between zero and one, this is y, and if your desired output were here, typically your desired output is going to be either zero or one when you're performing classification. But if you had a desired output that was something other than zero or one, once again, you're gonna find that the, the cross entropy loss is convex. It's a bowl with a minimum at the desired solution. And you'll observe something, this guy, he's a much smoother, much more friendly kind of loss function than the cross entropy, right? So why do we use cross entropy and not the L2 loss? Even if I'm looking at probabilities, even if I'm trying to make predictions of probabilities, there's nothing stopping you from using the L2 loss. So why do you use the cross entropy loss? That actually pops up when you actually, when you look at, uh, when you go one step further. These things are convex as a function of y, which is the output of the network. That does not mean that they are convex with respect to the parameters of the network. So first, anytime you want to use any kind of regression, the most common loss is L2 because the kullback leibler divergence doesn't really apply. But when the intent is classification, you really want the, the cross entropy or the kullback leibler divergence. Why? So this is the L2 divergence. So in this case, I have a uh, perceptron, which has only two inputs, x1 and x2. And each of these has a weight w1 and w2. This is the sigmoid perceptron. And I'm computing the loss between this guy and a desired output. And this is the divergence that I'm plotting against w1 and w2 for a given x for a given d. Now you can vary x and d, the figure is going to show more or less the same kind of shape. So this is what the kullback leibler divergence looks like. It's still a bowl as a function of w1 and w2. But when you look at the L2 loss, although the L2 loss by itself is nice and quadratic, when you look at it as a function of the weights of the network, what does it look like? The figure to the left, is that convex? Anyone? This one here? Not really, right? It's flattening out as you go out. So I, in fact, if you go from here, as you can see, I can draw a line from here to here and that's going to be outside the curve, below the curve. So although the L2 loss also has an optimum, has a minimum exactly where you want the solution to be, the behavior as a function of the parameters is really not the kind of behavior that you would like to see, which is why we actually end up using the cross entropy loss rather than the L2 loss in these cases, right? So note here that L2 is not convex with respect to the parameters, while the KL is convex, although both of them have a unique global minimum at exactly the same place. So uh, by the way, this is just a side note on derivatives. For L2 divergence, the derivative with respect to the pre-activation is going to be, if I'm using an L2, it's the de derivative of half of y minus d whole squared, right? If you write, expand it out, it's going to be y minus d times something. So this is actually the real error between the output and the target output. And so because what you were actually propagating backwards was also always the actual error, the uh, back propagation algorithm was often also called the error back propagation algorithm. Now this name actually only makes sense if you're thinking of it in terms of L2 loss, but you get the idea, right? Anyway, so the story so far, Gradient descent can be sped up by incremental updates. Convergence can be improved using smoothed updates. And 
the choice of divergence affects both the, the uh, learned network and the results you're going to get from the network. Right? Questions? No. Okay. So moving on, now let's begin looking at some optimization methods. So the first thing, or how many of you have had to deal with uh, batch norm? How many of you have not dealt with batch norm in your homework? That answer should be zero. If you've done homework zero, you know, the homework's batch norm is part of the code, right? So what exactly is this batch normalization? Now, this has to do with this business of covariate shifts. When I'm working with mini batches, the assumption I'm making is that every mini batch is statistically very similar to every other mini batch. So it's like saying that all, all of these colored patches, they represent different mini batches, and they lie in more or less the same region of the space, and they have more or less the same distribution. This is the assumption that we make when we actually work with mini batches. But what really happens? Each of the mini batches, batches is going to have its own uh, unique characteristic. They're, good, they're all going to be off by some amount. In fact, they can be very far apart, right? So, uh, in other words, the mini batches have a covariate shift with respect to the overall loss function. The global loss function, which, which is the loss that you expected divergence over the entire input space. That is the real loss that you're trying to minimize, correct? Whereas what we are minimizing is the empirical loss over the mini batches. And each of the mini batches can have a, a generic shift with respect to the, or the, the, uh, to the, the loss function for each of the mini batches can have a generic shift with respect to the actual function that you're, going to, you're trying to minimize. So you have a covariate shift. Each of the mini batches can actually be in a completely different location. And so what we would like to do is to sort of normalize these mini batches so they all have somewhat similar the param the, uh, char statistical characteristics. And then we can, act and then we work on the normalized mini batches. Now, what we mean by normalizing the mini batches is in principle, all of, the, all of the mini batches must be in one location, but in practice, they are far away. So what we would like to do is to move these guys back to, this, to, to the one location where they must be if all of them are representative of the actual loss function, and then perform the optimization at that point. But then how do you move them back? Where do you move them back to? There is no answer, right? We don't know where they shifted from to these locations. So what we can do instead is to decide on some standard point, and what is the most standard point in the space? The origin. And so we can move them all to the origin of the space, and we can move not just the mean, but also normalize them out so that the variances are also uh, standard across all of the mini batches. And then we can actually learn the location that that mini batch must be in and move all of these batches to that one location. And this is the whole business of batch normalization. When we're performing batch normalization, what we are really doing is that we are moving each mini batch to the origin, and then from the origin to our target location, which is common to all the mini batches. And now, how do we actually move the mini batches to the origin? First, for each mini batch, we want to normalize the mean of the mini batch to zero. That way it's moved to the origin. Second, for each mini batch, you want to normalize the variances to one. Now they all have the same scatter. And then thereafter, you can move them to the desired location. So the mini batches, this, this normalization, the way you have seen it is typically applied on the affine combination of inputs. So in your standard uh, per neuron, you first computed an affine combination of the inputs and then performed an activation on this affine combination. So the normalization sits between these two. It's going to sit here. Now this is, it's not required to be here. You can, we can perform this operation at any location in the network, but here's where is the most common uh, application of uh, batch normalization. So you're going to have this normalization occurring uh, uh, imposed between the affine combination and the activation for every neuron where, we, where you decide to actually have a batch normalization. So, uh, and these adjustments, 
these occur over many batches. They're obviously, you can't do this when you're doing stochastic gradient descent because there's no notion of a mean or a variance for a single instance. This only makes sense when you're working on mini batches where you have a mean and a variance for the batch. It also doesn't have any, make any sense when you're looking at the entire training data because all of the data are in one location, right? So how can I actually look at this? This is the affine combination, Z, and this is the batch normalized, normalized output. And the batch normalization occurs between Z and Z hat. And the activation is applied to Z hat. So this is how we actually perform it. And we're going to perform this independently for every neuron because it's, it's much more convenient. If you wanted to think of these as vector operations across all neurons, it becomes very complex. So what is this batch normalization it itself? Here's what you do. There are two steps in batch normalization. First, the first step is to move all the data to the origin. The second step is to move the data from the origin to the target location. So remember, we did this, right? So the first step is to move from here to here. And the second step is to go from here to here. So what is this business of moving to the origin? To move, move, moving to the origin means that first you subtract the mean. That means the scatter, now it's been centered at zero. Then you divide by the standard deviation, which means it's been normalized to have a scatter of one. And then having done that, then you sort of rescale it by gamma to have the desired spread, and then shift it by beta to sit in the correct location. So you see the set of operations over here? There's a two-step operation. First, you normalize it. You bring it to the center. You normalize it. Then you scale it to the correct size, which is common to all the mini batches, and then shift it to the location, uh, to a common location for all the mini batches. Right? So, yeah. I'm thinking, why do we um, do the batch normalization to any neural and act uh, activation function, not out? You can do it in any location. There's, it's, this is just a, this is a covariate shift. You could apply it pretty much anywhere. You just pick your locations. This is where it's most commonly done, right? So there's no magic. It's just a covariate, accounting for covariate shift. That's all it is doing. And it has to do with the fact that the different, different mini batches are going to be sitting in different locations. You've got to sort of uh, account for this, right? So now, done. So here are all the equations that, I, that we would have. For each mini batch, you're first going to compute the average for the mini batch. You're going to compute the average z value for the mini batch. You're also going to compute the, the, uh, the variance of the z values for the mini batch. Subsequently, you're going to be subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, the square root of the variance. There's a plus epsilon over there just because if there's no variance, then you're going to have a blow up. Having a plus epsilon simply makes sure that thing, the computation is stable, right? So this portion you understand. This portion is what happens in the first block. What happens in the second block is that this u is subsequently moved to the new location where you first scale it by gamma, so you get the proper scatter, and then you shift it by beta, which puts it in the correct position, right? So now this looks like a simple enough operation, but the problem here is that now computing derivatives ends up becoming quite painful. And on the other hand, you already have the tools because we've sort of may, I've sort of forced you to go through some of these concept and concepts in your quiz. And so let's see how these derivatives are actually computed, right? Uh, so first, so here are all the various terms, right? Now, uh, so this guy is the u, this is the shift. I can redraw this whole operation in this manner just to clarify. This is the affine combination. This block is the same as this guy, which normalizes the z. It shifts it to the center and then scales the scatter to have a value of 1. Then subsequently, you're multiplying it by a gamma, and then you're adding a beta. So this operation is the second block, right? Now, and the outcome is the batch normalized z hat to which you apply your, uh, apply your uh, activation. Now, when you're performing back propagation, at some point, when you arrive at this particular neuron, 
you would have computed the derivative of the divergence with respect to y. This we know how to do, no problem, right? We also know how to propagate this derivative past the activation using the chain rule. So now this means you can compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the z hat, which is the batch normalized version of z. This too is not a problem, right? Okay. Now, what happens next? The parameters to learn are gamma and beta, right? So we need to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to gamma and beta. Then there's something else that we must do. We must propagate this derivative all the way back to the next level of neurons. That means you also need the derivative of the divergence with respect to z. That's the only way you're going to be propagating everything backwards. So let's see what these three terms must be. What are these three derivatives? First, the derivative of the divergence with respect to gamma and beta are very simple. You can just look at this equation. You want, if you use back prop, you've already got this term, the derivative of the divergence with respect to z hat. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to gamma is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z hat times u, right? The derivative of the divergence with respect to beta is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z hat. So this is straightforward, nothing fancy. This is easy, right? The real complication now arise, arises when you're moving backwards. The next thing you want is to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to u, and guess what? This is also easy. I can just use the same formula. I have the derivative of the divergence with respect to z hat. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to u is going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to z hat times gamma, right? So, or is it gamma? One, one. I think it's one over gamma. I might mean, have made a mistake. I'll go back and check. Send me a note, okay? But the point is, at this point, you have the derivative of the divergence with respect to u. And the real magic now is I want to take this derivative and back propagate it back to z. And that is a painful process. Why? Because what happens in between is fairly complicated. And what happens? Here, uh, so let me give you the relationship between u and z, right? Or the relationship between first the divergence. So let's, let's, let me talk about all of the terms that actually influence the divergence. So the divergence is a function of u, obviously, because u is going to pro propagating through the network, right? U has been modified by the mean and the standard deviation, the variance. And now, here is what really happens. Uh, if my divergence, I have z, right? And I have u, and this goes on to, I'm going to use this to compute the divergence. Now, if mu affects u, and sigma square affects u, then there is no direct influence of mu and sigma squared on the divergence, correct? The only influence that mu and sigma squared have are on u, and those affect the divergence. So in which case, this equation would be wrong, in the sense that I'm implying a direct influence on, on the divergence by, u and mu, uh, by mu and sigma squared, and in this figure, clearly, they're not there. They're absent, right? So why am I writing it in this manner? Anybody? There is actually a second influence, right? And why would that be? As you think everybody's asleep or not asleep, someone has to take a guess. Let me tell you, right? This guy, so the way to think about it is that I have Z1 through ZB, right? These are all the entries in the mini batch. And then each of these guys is going to affect mu. Each of these guys is going to affect sigma squared, and mu also affects sigma squared. Correct? And then for each of these guys, I'm going to have z mu and sigma squared affecting this is what happens right for each of these z's mu and sigma squared affects you 
and all of these u's affect the divergence. Correct? So as a result, what happens is that because of these other terms, divergence is a direct function of mu and sigma squared. Uh, it's indirect. It's indirect through these other u's. But if I don't write the u's down, what it means is that divergence is not merely a function of u. It also is affected by changing mu and sigma squared independently of u. See what I'm talking about? So when I write things in this manner, then the derivative of the divergence with respect to zi is going, can be written in terms of three partials, which is the derivative of the divergence with respect to ui times the derivative of ui with respect to zi plus the derivative of the divergence with respect to mu times the derivative of mu with respect to zi plus the derivative of the divergence with respect to sigma squared times the derivative of sigma squared with respect to zi. Right? See what I'm talking about? And so the actual figure is going to look like this. Actually, this figure is kind of, it's not as clean as it should have been. So what I want you to think of is that figure out there really looks like this. It is, uh, oh my, it's already 9.50, okay. So it's z, i, this is mu, this is uh, sigma squared, and then this is, what do I have, u, right, u, and this is the divergence, but then these guys both go to u j not equal to i. This is u i, this is z i, right? So all they have driven, uh, written, uh, drawn direct lines between z, z and mu and divergence, the real connection is both of these connect to the other u's, u j not equal to i, and these connect to the divergence, right? So now, here is the uh, derivative of the divergence with respect to the z's explicitly written out. Let's look at the individual terms. What is the derivative of the divergence with respect to sigma squared? I have to consider all of these paths. So that's simply going to be, if I actually write it down, the sigma squared affects all of these u's across the batch, which affects the divergence, right? And so the uh, derivative of the divergence with respect to sigma squared is the sum over all of these guys times the partial derivative of the divergence with respect to u times the derivative of u with respect to sigma squared. If you work this out, that's this term, right? So that's only giving you this first term. Now you need the second term. That second term I can directly get. Now sigma squared is a function of zi in two ways, directly and through mu, right? But if I do that, if I work out the derivative, it just comes out to this term. Just work it out comes out to this term, right? I won't actually do it on the board. I'll let you convince yourself and do it on pen and paper, but it's really very trivial. Now, similarly, now let's consider this term, the derivative of the divergence with respect to mu. You have all of these guys going in here, right? But then I can sort of simplify it. I don't need to explicitly consider the, the, uh, the dependence of sigma squared through all of these u's on the divergence. I can say that mu affects all the u's which affect divergence. Mu affects sigma squared, which also affects the divergence, right? Because there is no direct connection from sigma squared to divergence. This connect, sigma squared always goes through some u. So I can just sort of uh, separate it out. And now when I write out the derivative, it's going to be the sum of, uh, I'm going to be summing over all of the u's, the partial derivative of divergence with respect to u times the derivative of the divergence with uh, a derivative of u with respect to mu, plus the second term is the partial derivative computed down this branch, which is the derivative of the divergence with respect to sigma squared times the derivative of sigma squared with respect to mu, right? So I'll go back and look at the slides. I'm not actually going to work, I'll work this out. This will take two or three minutes, but I don't have the time. But I, I assume you get the idea, right? So having done this, now between, so the second term here is of course the derivative of the divergence of, derivative of mu with respect to z, which is easy to compute. It just comes up from this formula. Uh, I don't have the formula here, this just comes out to one over b, right? 
So then what remains in this entire figure? What remains in this entire figure is this one dependency between the divergence and zi, because if you look here, every other dependency has been accounted for, right? The only one dependency remaining is the arc on top, which is simply going to be the derivative of the divergence with respect to ui times the partial derivative of direct derivative of ui with respect to zi. And so if you sum all three terms, you're going to end up with the total derivative of the divergence with respect to zi. So uh, again, I'm not going to go over this arithmetic in great detail right now, but if you actually go back and look at the slides, you'll find that it all makes sense. The math is right, right? And the logic should also be fairly clear to you. So once I've computed the derivative of the divergence with respect to z, I can just use back propagation and continue backwards from there, and all is fine, right? So we've sort of figured out uh, how exactly to train, so how exactly to compute gammas and, uh, and betas to position you in the right location, and uh, how to train the whole system. But then what happens? During test time, you don't operate on mini batches. You operate on one instance at a time, whereas over here, the mean and the variance that you were computing for the use were computed over a mini batch, right? So during test, where do those mu's and sigmas come from? So what we will do is to average the mu's and the sigmas over all of our batches. And those are the mu's that we have, those are the uh, estimates that we're going to use for the covariate shift for the test data. Now, if you are working on operating on batches of test data, then it makes sense to be actually computing these uh, covariate shifts on the batches of test data. But for a single instance, this really has to come from somewhere else, and we'll just use the averages computed over the training data. Right. Questions? You dealt with this, yeah. So if you use batch you can Yeah. Right, again, assuming that the batch has got consistent behavior, but yes. So batch normalization is, doesn't have to be applied everywhere. It could be applied to uh, some layers or so, to some selected neurons and some layers. At this point, it becomes heuristic. Uh, it improves anecdotally about convergence rate and the classification accuracy. And uh, uh, apparently, using batch normalization eliminates the need for dropout that we will look at in a few minutes. And uh, for maximum benefit from batch normalization, you want to sort of increase the learning rates, and the learning rate decay must be faster. The reason for this is that when you actually look at the activation function, what batch normalization does is to place all of the data around zero where the activation function, regardless of which one you choose, has the steepest slope. And so it learns really fast, right? So, uh, and for this to work, the training data has to be properly normalized because if you don't properly normalize the training data, this whole, all of these covariate shifts can become fairly extreme. And the estimates that you get uh, for the fixed covariate shift that you will apply on the test data is going to be so off that your uh, performance is going to take a hit, right? So these are papers from uh, EOF and Zegedi's, these are figures from EOF and Zegedi's paper in 2015. This was the inception network, that's how much it was the best uh, image classification network of the time. And I think these are how many training instances they have to use. And this is the performance they get after 30 million steps. Whereas if they use batch normalization, they can get better performance way earlier, as you can see, right? So uh, it makes a huge difference to both, not just the convergence rate, but also to the performance. So the story so far, adding to everything, covariate shift between training and test may cause problems that may be handled by batch normalization, right? Now, great. So we've been talking in general about trying to learn functions, and I've sort of made some vague assumptions about how the functions should just be learned by the network. And in so saying, I've sort of lied a bit, right? And where is the lie? So I'm saying we attempt to learn the entire function from just a few snapshots of the function. Will you really learn the function? So what we do is, remember, we define an error between the actual output of the network 
and the desired output, the error could be positive or negative, so you take the squared error or you take some other uh, divergence function, and this is what you minimize. And when you minimize it, there's nothing saying that you're actually going to learn this blue dotted function that you want to learn. You could just end up learning the red curve, which fits perfectly on the training instances, but is garbage everybody, everywhere else, right? So now how bad is this problem? Now this problem, to give you an idea of how bad this problem can be, let's consider a very trivial example. Consider that you're working on images of 100 pixels. 100 pixel images are 10 cross 10 images. They're really, really small. And consider, for instance, that each of the pixels is either zero or one. So these are binary images, right? How many different images can you define on 10 cross 10, uh, on a 10 cross 10 grid where each pixel is binary? Two raised to 100, or 10 raised to 30, right? If you want to, so basically you're trying to specify a function on the corners of a 100 dimensional hypercube. And there are 10 raised to 30 such corners. So if I want to specify the function fully, I have to func specify the function value at e every one of these corners, right? Which means I need to actually provide 10 raised to 30 training instances. So now suppose I give you 10 raised to 15 training instances. How much is 10 raised to 15? One quintillion training instances. Nobody ever saw one quintillion training instances for any problem, right? You're still going to be a factor of 10 raised to 15 off. Basically, you're not providing any training data at all. You're giving one, quint one quintillionth of the training data you actually require to specify the function. To give you a better idea of how bad this is, let's say each of these edges is some finite length, I don't care what it is, and let's say you sit in a really small spacecraft and you sit in one of the corners of this hypercube where there's a training data instance, and then you begin randomly traveling down the various edges. The universe will end before you hit the next training instance. That's how sparse your data are, right? Just to give you an idea. Now if I scale that whole thing down by taking logs, you're literally doing this. You're giving the equivalent of just slightly more than one training data point per dimension and saying, find me the function. Right? Does this even begin to make sense? It doesn't make sense, right? So if this is the case, then, and this is with, even if I give you 10 raised to 15 training instances on this trivial problem, which is learning about images on a 100 pixel grid, where the pixels are binary. If I increase the image size, if I go from binary to you know, 256 pixel values, the thing is going to get so much worse, so much worse. So let's sort of look at a simplified variant of this problem. So we need additional constraints to fill in the missing regions properly, and for that, let's look at a simpler variant of this problem. Let's say I'm just trying to do a binary classification, right? And I want to look at these training, uh, from these training data instances, I want to look at an instance and say, decide whether it is blue or red. Now, these are all my training data instances. Would you want the curve to be function you learn to be like this or like that? Which one would you want? The smooth one, clearly, right? I mean, assuming that, that the data follow the natural properties of real data. There are conditions where you might really want it bouncing around, but the one that you're really looking for is the smooth function, most times. And the problem is that this network, if I don't constrain it, remember, a neural network is a universal approximator. It can approximate any function. If I'm trying to fit training data given a sufficient number of neurons, it's going to learn that every single time. Even if my perceptrons are not threshold neurons, if my percept each of my neurons over here is a sigmoid function, the actual function I will end up learning is this guy. Why? Because I can fit it. And this way I don't make any errors at all, right? So where does this behavior actually come from? This behavior comes from, from the fact that when I have a network of this kind, this network actually permits these steep increases in function value that are required to capture this training data. And why is that? If you look at a sigmoid, if I look at a single perceptron, the perceptron value looks like this, right? 
the steepness of the or the steepness of the sigmoid depends on the weights. The larger the weights, the steeper the sigmoid is going to be. If the weights are infinity, this sigmoid is going to be a step. And the moment I permit each of my sigmoids to actually be a perfect step, then it can learn this function, right? Because I'm allowing every neuron to rise as fast as it wants to, which means that the, that the output neuron can now rise as fast as it wants to, which means it can learn this function. But I don't want to learn this function. So what is my compromise? I'm going to say none of these neurons is permitted to become infinitely steep. How would I impose the constraint that the neuron is not allowed to become infinitely steep? I say the weight of the neuron cannot get larger than some value. Or I can say, impose the constraint that I also want you to minimize the weights of the neuron themselves, the length of the weight vector for the neuron. If I do that, now the individual neurons can no longer become like so. They're sort of pushed by trying to minimize the weights of the neurons. Uh, the edges, I'm trying to push the individual neurons towards this blue shape, which means that now they can actually learn this function. But because I'm sort of not permitting them to learn the red curve over here for the individual neurons, the overall network too will not learn this bizarre function. Make sense to you? Right? So how exactly am I going to push this the weights of the individual neurons. How am I going to ensure that they don't get large enough to learn the wrong function? So what I will do is to modify my training. Now this is the standard, uh, standard uh, training problem, right? You define, you, 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 you define your uh, uh, loss, which is the average divergence over all the training instances, and this is what you minimize, correct? Instead, I'm going to say not only do, do I want you to minimize the error, in addition, I want you to minimize the length of the weights vector into each of the neurons. So this sort of forces each of the neurons to be less aggressive, and having this constraint will sort of ensure that the function I learn is much smoother. And exactly how important is it for me to learn, the learn a smooth function? That is decided by this value lambda which can be chosen based on, say, say some performance on held out data or all the usual uh, tricks that you will use in uh, machine learning. But this is now a regularization which actually ensures that the function that you learn ends up being smooth. And you've, you've used uh, the, these regularizers in your uh, homeworks already, right? So this doesn't change your overall training algorithm very much because all you have to do now is that in addition to taking the derivative of the divergence, you also have to take the derivative of this, re of this regularization term, which is simply like saying that to each gradient, I'm going to add lambda times the weights parameter itself. So this works whether you're doing batch or stochastic gradient or mini batch. In each case, you just get this little additive term over here, and the update rule never changed. So this is a very simple extension to the training process, which sort of ensures that you learn smoother functions that keep you from learning uh, that reduce the possibility that you will learn rubbish functions. It doesn't mean that you, you still won't learn rubbish functions. You, you will not learn rubbish functions. You still could, but it sort of enforces some, some smoothness on what you actually learn. So uh, this is just the mini batch update uh, 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 pseudocode. The only thing that changed was out here, right? Now you can use the same thing along with all of the other methods, momentum, what have you. The basic idea is that the loss function has changed, not the optimizer, right? There's another way through which you can actually learn uh, to, to impose some kind of smoothness constraint on the network. Now, the MLP itself naturally imposes constraints. Remember that I, when I took a certain number of neurons, if I reduce the number of neurons in the input layer, the number of functions that I could learn reduced. We saw this in lecture two, remember? So one way to, even if I give you a large number of neurons, one way to restrict the number of functions, the set of functions that can be learned by the network is to make the individual layers thin while, if required, making the network deeper so that you still manage to, uh, so, so that you still 
uh, provide the network with sufficient ability to come close to whatever data that you're trying to model. So for a given number of parameters, deeper networks impose more of a smoothness constraint. Why am I calling this a smoothness constraint? Basically, each layer works on a function that has already been approximated by the previous layer. So as I keep adding layers, the thing becomes smoother and smoother, right? And we saw why, and uh, we saw some of this even in lecture two. So let's look at some examples of how this works. Here are two two-dimensional decision boundaries that I'm trying to learn. And in each case, we got the 1,000 training data points from each of these, so you have 500 blacks and 500 whites. Then take, it, take a very large network and use every learning trick known to mankind and try to learn this decision boundary using the network when I try to make the network kind of you know, wide. And here are the kinds of decision boundaries you actually end up learning for this uh, crazy problem, right? So on the other hand, if I take the same, th this was using 660 layers, uh, neurons. I, so this is another of the same things. I rearranged the same network in different ways. So when I rearrange the network as three layers of 220 neurons, here's the boundary I learn. Four layers of 115, this is what I learn. Six layers of 110, this is what I learn. 11 layers of 60, this is what I learn. So you see with the same number of neurons, as I make the layers thinner and the network deeper, the constraints that I impose naturally sort of end up learning the decision boundaries I are much more likely to learn the decision boundaries that I want cleanly, right? So this, we generally tend to pre, if with the proper activation functions. Again, remember, you need for, for, if you narrow down the layers, your activation functions must be able to transmit the information down. And uh, so uh, with the appropriate number of, uh, with the appropriate activation functions, you generally prefer uh, shallow but deep networks, right? I mean, uh, narrow but deep networks. So the final trick that we'll look at in the last few minutes is something called dropout. There have been other regularizations, L1 regularizations. Uh, you add noise for regularization, et cetera. I won't go over those. Dropout is something that everybody looks at, so we'll take a look. But just to close up, before closing up, data under specification can result in overfitted models, and you need regularization, and more constraint, generally deeper network architectures, right? So let's look at dropout. It starts off with this notion of bagging. Now, bagging was a, was a method proposed by Leo Breiman many, many years ago, where given a certain number of amount of training data, you would sample the training data in different ways, and from each sample, you would learn in different classifier. So that way, depending on the sample, you'd get many different classifiers, and then the final output would be, would be obtained by averaging or voting across all of the classifiers that you learned. So, uh, Dropout is kind of built on this principle, but let's go and look at what dropout really is. So let's say I have a network of this kind. Then during training for each input at each iteration, I'm going to turn off each neuron with some probability one minus alpha. So what do I mean by turning off the neuron? I'm going to go through the neuron and say, okay, you, you aren't there. Flip a coin where the probability of heads is alpha. And if the coin comes up a tails, then I say, you, you aren't there, and I'm gonna knock it off. And I do this for all of the neurons that, I'm going to, that I actually apply this idea to. Now in practice, what this means is that I'm going to go through all of the neurons, and any time a neuron draws the wrong end of the, the wrong side of the coin, I'm going to set the output, force the output to zeros. That's, that's as if the neuron really isn't there, right? Now, this is going to be done differently for different inputs. For each input, I'm going to go through all of the neurons and flip a coin, which means that different inputs may actually see different networks. So I've shown you three different inputs with, diff with the neurons that were switched off for each of the three inputs. And what will happen is each of the three new inputs basically sees a completely different network. And this is what you're, so you're actually going to, this is the network that you would use when you perform back propagation on that particular input. Again. Each time you go through your training data, you're going to repeat the process, which means even for the same input, every time you revisit that input, it may see a completely different network, right? So uh, here's what really happened. The statistical interpretation. For a network which has two raised to n neurons, there are two raised, uh, which has n neurons, 
there are two ways to n possible ways of switching the neurons off, right? So in effect, if I ran, I can compose two rays to n possible subnetworks using each of the different combinations of these neurons. And so what this process implicitly does is to, it's like bagging. Instead of training one network, you're training all of these two rays to n possible networks simultaneously. And for each input, you're randomly selecting the specific network that you're actually going to be using from this collection to train. So this is basically what is happening, or this is the explanation that's actually given to this process uh, in, the, in the literature, right? So this is, like an this is like a variant of bagging. Now, practically what happens, it draw forces the neurons to learn rich and redundant patterns. So consider this network over here. I have an input, and I have a fully connected net layer going to the next layer of neurons. Now there's nothing stopping my network from putting all of the classification effort in the first, in the last two layers and simply learning an identity transform in this layer, right? It could just learn to push the data through and put all the effort in the later layers. That's not a great thing to be doing. So the moment you begin introducing dropout, the ability to learn identity transforms goes away. So each of these neurons now ends up learning to detect some, detect real patterns as opposed to simply copying the input over or some simplified combination of the input over. So you end up learning uh, rich and somewhat redundant patterns when you actually train the network in this manner. And so this makes it more, more both to generalize better and to, uh, and the training itself becomes more robust. Now, so, uh, how exactly do you do this? Yeah. I'll skip this to the code. Now, uh, so during training, what really happens? When you're performing backpropagation, you're going to be using this network for backpropagation, meaning when you're propagating things backwards, some of the neurons are gonna be missing. And the exact details of it, I mean, you've done this in your code, but please do go over this uh, pseudocode because I'm going to be querying about this in the quiz, okay? So one thing, how do you use this network? Each neuron now actually has this activation. It's computing an output, but then the actual output is being multiplied by a D, where D is a binary Bernoulli variable, which comes up one with probability alpha and zero with a probability one minus alpha, right? So what is the expected output of the neuron? The expected output of the neuron is simply going to be alpha times the output of the neuron. So during test time for each of the neurons, you're going to be using the expected output of the neuron rather than selecting any individual network or train explicitly training all the networks and averaging. So this is an approximation, but it works. This is an approximation to actually explicitly evaluating all two raised to n networks, but it works. So there are a couple of different ways of implementing this. Observe that you will never do a dropout on the final layer because you really want all of your outputs, right? Uh, so, but for every other layer, you can think of the affine combination as a weighted combination of the outputs of the previous layer. The output of the previous layer itself is going to be that activation multiplied by alpha. So, which is the same as saying I use a regular network, but now I'm going to be scaling all the weights by alpha. So, during test time, you're going to, you're going to multiply all of the weights going out of neurons that were subject to dropout by this factor alpha to account for the fact that you're really computing the expected output of that neuron. Now there's a different way of doing the same thing. During training, I can replace the activation by alpha inverse sigma, which is a cheaper trick. And this doesn't affect the dropout procedure itself, but then during, output, during the operation, I can just use sigma, right? So this is the same as multiplying, post multiplying the activations by alpha after training. I can pre-multiply the outputs by alpha inverse during training and both of them give you the same behavior, right? And so that actually ends up being a much simpler procedure when you're doing forward, using the forward pass. So here are some typical results uh, that, uh, that Nitish Srivastava et al. Uh, reported way back in 2013 test error on different architectures of MNIST with and without dropout, and they can show that without dropout, these networks sort of saturated about 1.6% error. When they use dropout, it keeps going down. 
right? It actually makes the networks much more robust and much more able to learn. So for dropouts, which is of individual neurons, there are various extensions to this. We have zone out, which uh, randomly uh, for recurrent networks, which switches off neurons across time transitions. You have drop connect, where you drop off individual connections instead of individual neurons. You have shake out, white out, various variants of this. Uh, take a look at the slides, right? But these are all basic, many variants of the basic idea of dropout. So uh, adding to our story so far, dropout is a stochastic model erasure method that sometimes forces the network to learn most, more robust models. So the last few slides, I will actually let them be, and I'll stop, but we're talking about the heuristics of early stopping, where we say that if you continue to train, the performance on some valid validation data may actually get worse. So one trick is to keep track of the performance on validation data and stop the training when the performance on validation data begins to get worse. Uh, gradient clipping is a very common technique that people will use. You're gonna have to use this. Uh, if your objective function is kind of nasty, then there are locations where the gradient is going to just become very large. And the, when the gradient is very large, if you use gradient descent, at that point your estimate can, get, can blow up. So typically we will use some kind of a threshold on the gradient, say, if the gradient is, if the derivative is greater than theta, I'm gonna use a ceiling of theta. Uh, other techniques like just taking your same data, your training data, and distorting it in different ways, and augmenting your training data with distorted versions of your training data. Again, all of these are different techniques that are commonly applied, and you're probably gonna have to end up doing these in your homework. Okay? So stopping here, and then the, uh, initialization techniques. Many of these are going to be covered in your uh, recitation. Right? I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs>